Hi, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'm Kim Schultz, a gene therapy reviewer in the Offices of Tissues and Advanced Therapies. I'm going to be giving you some insight into the regulatory considerations for CAR T cells. But before I get into those details, I wanted to introduce you to our office, the Office of Tissues and Advanced Therapies. OTAT is an office in the Center for Biologics and is composed of five divisions. Today you'll be hearing from representatives from the Division of Cellular and Gene Therapies, and then you'll get preclinical and clinical advice from two of our colleagues in the Division of Clinical Evaluation and Pharmacology Toxicology. Our office has purview over a wide range of products, from gene therapies to stem cell-based therapies and blood and plasma-derived products. I'll be focusing on gene therapies, as that's uh, the products that I review, which in and of themselves is a diverse field, including vectored in vivo therapies, personalized vaccines, and ex vivo genetically modified cells. I will be focusing on CAR T cells, but the general considerations here can be applied to other ex vivo modified cells that you may be developing. In the U.S., CAR T cells are regulated as a cell-based human gene therapy. This therapy reprograms T cells to identify cell surface antigens. Upon identification and activation, the CAR T cells expand and differentiate, resulting in the destruction of target cells through both direct and indirect CAR T cell immune activities. To date, there are four licensed autologous CAR T cell products in the U.S all of which are for the treatment of hematologic malignancies. The picture is much different in the clinical trials, though, where there's a diversity of antigens being targeted, and more than 11% of all uh, CAR T cell INDs in-house are for allergenic products, and that number is growing every day. So what's the difference between these two? Allergenic CAR T cells are producing individual lots that can treat many patients, whereas autologous CAR T cells are producing a single lot for each individual patient, starting with that patient's own uh, leukapheresis material. That being said, the regulatory requirements and expectations are pretty similar between the two, with qualification of raw materials, a well thought out manufacturing and testing strategy, and then distribution logistics in place. There are some nuances, though, and I'll be pointing these out throughout today's talks. So as a developer, you've thought about what your target is, what type of CAR T cell you're going to have, but where do you start when you want to begin your clinical trial? My number one recommendation is to take a look at the Gene Therapy CMC guidance that was published about a year ago. It follows the CTD format and gives advice pertaining to each part of the CMC section. There's useful information pertaining to expectations through different stages of development, and also there's special considerations for ex vivo modified cells. There are many other guidances available uh, through this link that I've provided that are related to cell and gene therapies. Uh, we've been busy developing uh, many guidances over the past couple of years to help you as you develop your product throughout the different stages. I'd also like to highlight that hopefully we will have guidances that give information on all disciplines for both CAR T cells and products that incorporate genome editing coming out as drafts later this year. But we know that it is always better to try and ask specific questions about your product and get advice back from a person. At Seabird, we do have options throughout the development process uh, to interact with us at the FDA, and I'd really like to highlight that we have two informal meetings at the earliest stages of development. And this is really important specifically for OTAT-regulated products, since many of these products are novel or use novel technologies in their manufacturing. CAT meetings, which are held in conjunction with the Seabird Advanced Technology Team, provide a venue for FDA discussions directly with developers of innovative technology that are used in production of CBER products. Interact meetings, which were previously referred to as pre-pre-IND meetings, 
focus on early preclinical studies and will be discussed in more detail by my colleague Ying in a couple talks from now. CMC discussions during an interact meeting may center on very early developmental concerns, such as the use of novel technologies and developing product testing strategies. I'd like to point out the difference really between the CAT and the interact meetings. So the interact meetings are between the eventual IND sponsor and the FDA, whereas the CAT meetings provide a venue for developers of products that support CBER regulated products to come and talk to the FDA. These are people who may be submitting a master file later for INDs to cross-reference. We also assist our sponsors regularly during development, and an important stage when you're thinking about starting a clinical trial is a pre-IND meeting. This is a critical time to check in where you can determine if your plans align with our current expectations for your product, and you get information on what needs to be clarified in that.
We also recommend additional pathogen testing, which can be discussed at a pre-IND meeting. We also recommend that there are some minimal requirements in characterization testing on the incoming material. Understanding the variety of incoming material that can be accommodated by your manufacturing process is paramount to consistently manufacturing a quality product. Lastly, you have to introduce the car somehow. And this is usually done by some type of vector. The choice of vector is up to you. For instance, plasmid, retrovirus or lentivirus, or AAV vectors. Regardless of the type of vector, we consider the vector to be a critical component in the manufacturing process. As such, the information should be organized into a separate drug substance section in your IND and should provide enough detail on the manufacturing and testing for us to evaluate the quality. This includes characterization of the cell bank from which the vector was produced and manufacturing under phase-specific CGMPs. All release testing should be conducted prior to use in the CAR T cell manufacturing process as indicated in the table here. Some of the recommended testing is specific for the type of vector that you're using, um, and so you should take that into consideration when using this table. Additionally, you should set up a stability program uh, with a subset of this recommended testing. We also recommend that you have some type of test in here, such as a titering assay, in order to determine the amount of vector that will be used in the CAR T-cell manufacturing process. When manufacturing allogenic CAR T-cells, the endogenous TCR will need to be blocked or knocked out to reduce the risk of graft versus host disease, GBHD. One way to do this is by genome editing, and throughout today's talk, I'll be giving additional information uh, in case you decide to use genome editing in your product. If you employ genome editing, the nuclease targeting elements and donor template are all considered critical components, and therefore detailed information should be included in the IND similar to what we expect for the vector. We recommend that you come in for an interact or a pre-IND meeting to discuss your strategy and the regulatory recommendations with us. At this point, you know what your product is going to be and the different components and materials that you're going to use to make it. It's been said many times that the process is the product for CAR T cells, which needs to accommodate such a wide range of starting material. So let's take a look at what that is. The process for manufacturing CAR T cells is logistically complex and uses a variety of biologically derived materials. When you're thinking about it, each step should be considered as to how it may affect the final product. And you can ask yourself questions at every single step um, related to what you're going to use, how much, how long. Importantly, changes to these per parameters during development may necessitate comparability studies down the road. Therefore, taking the time prior to initiating your clinical study to determine what the best process is for your product is a good place to start. I would also like to stress that for autologous products, the chain of identity must be maintained throughout the manufacturing process, and the controls in place to facilitate maintenance of the C of I should be documented in the IND submission. The same decision process can apply to allogenic products, but in this case, your donor is different from your patient, and so therefore, donor eligibility is of utmost importance as we had already talked about. The process itself is similar, though, between allergenic and autologous, and so your thought process may be different as you think about each step, uh, but the same considerations should be um, taken into account prior to starting your trial. Once your product is made, appropriate release testing and product characterization is important to confirm quality. We expect phase-appropriate release testing for your product. With tests appropriate, appropriately qualified, we recommend development of characterization assays to support 
development, and possible comparability studies. Later phase studies should be supported by validated assays, particularly for potency and dose determination. The data obtained during your clinical study should be used to inform the proposed commercial lot release processes. And I've indicated here um, the guidance related to analytical procedures and methods validation, which would be important for these later stage studies. There are a number of release tests that should be conducted for CAR T cells, and I'm once again providing you a table for your reference. All CAR T cells should be tested for microbial safety tests and identity. Additional safety testing when using an integrating vector includes determining the vector copy number, so how many actual insertions you've made uh, of the CAR transgene. We recommend that you characterize the amount of vector to use that optimizes the transduction rate uh, to the target that you're looking for with as reduced of an integration frequency as possible. The CAR T cell dose should be determined based on the number of transduced cells in your product, and this is generally determined by flow cytometry. Additionally, we recommend characterizing the population of cells, including T cell purity and subtype characterization, oftentimes also conducted by flow cytometry. Early in development, we recommend that you explore a number of potency measures, and it may be that a matrix of potency assays is best for your product. So that's the basic release testing that we would expect for CAR-T. There are additional release tests that we would expect if you're using um, genome editing or if you're manufacturing allergenic CAR-T cells, as indicated on the table now. These include safety tests to reduce the risk for GBHT and, if applicable, um, the evaluation of genome editing efficiency. In many cases, release testing, particularly potency testing, may need to be developed specifically for your product. Thorough product characterization can allow for process improvements, help determine CQAs, and can support comparability studies. But please remember that earlier on, I mentioned that gene therapy products don't often follow a normal clinical development timeline. Therefore, you should anticipate the need to develop and validate assays earlier in clinical development. So I've mentioned comparability studies here a few times. And in our experience, they're going to be needed at some point during your development. In most cases, there is a change during development in the materials, the manufacturing process, or the manufacturing facility that necessitate a comparability study. A, compar a comparability study will allow you to use the data generated before the change to support the post-change product. There are a number of factors that play into whether you will need a comparability study and how, how comprehensive the comparability study needs to be. In general, for CAR T cell products, we recommend that you use a split leukopheresis design to compare the effect of the change as depicted in the schematic on the right. In most cases, we recommend that more than release testing is compared, which is why characterization of your manufacturing process through development is important, so you can understand what parameters to include in your comparability study. In summary, I have given you a crash course in what CMC information is needed to get your CAR T cell study underway. I hope that I have imparted that quality should be built in throughout the manufacturing process through appropriate materials, process design, and testing. Specifically, planning ahead and thoughtful product characterization can save you time in the end as you approach licensure. Lastly, OTAT has been working hard over the last few years to provide you with useful guidances to navigate the process. Um, I have talked about quite a few uh, guidances throughout today's talk. Here are some of them um, with links, if applicable. And then here's my contact information uh, if you need it for after today. So at this point, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions.
Thanks, Dr. Schultz. I unabashedly adore T-cells, and, and I know that not only are you a regulatory scientist, but that you're also a real scientist. So I'd like to throw a question in that lets you take your FDA hat off and, and, and allow you to have the stage for the real scientist, and, and paint a picture for us. Synthetic cellular biology, off-the-shelf CAR T-cells, suppressed MHC, multiple suicide genes, inducible cytokine expression cassettes, targeting one of the questions in the in the granular stuff is targeting NK cells versus targeting dendritic cells to tumors. So there's so much that we can do. What can't we do, and what do you think we should do? Thanks. That's a great question to start us off on, and I'm sure we could talk about that um, for an hour in and of itself. Um, as you said in the beginning, there's not one single cure for cancer. Um, so there's not a magic bullet, even when it comes to CAR T cells, um, as we're moving forward. I think at this point, we've learned a lot from hematologic malignancies, but we've also learned that what works for them is probably not enough for solid tumors. Um, and so I think we're going to have to build off that foundation in order to develop different approaches um, for different types of cancers. Um, it, you know, if you're thinking about ideally, you would like something off the shelf so you, your patients don't have to wait for um, the manufacturing and testing timeline. Um, also, you know, there's thoughts in the field that a healthy donor T cell might be, uh, you know, a little bit more um, able to do its function than a, a patient's T cells who have been through so much chemotherapy. Um, it, you know, when we're thinking about solid tumors specifically, that micro uh, the tumor microenvironment is so hostile to the T cells, um, and the the tumor themselves, you know, the different cells in it uh, vary so much. And so um, it's it's going to be more, I would think, than um, just your normal co-stimulatory domain. So that being said, uh, I think we'd like to see something with an on-off switch, something to regulate that therapy so it doesn't get too hot. But also it might function in a way to manage T cell exhaustion. So that, um, you know, these CAR T cells that are going to hang around for years will be able to, to work again, um, it, you know, if the tumor does come back a little bit. I, that being said, I also think that um, what we've learned from our experience uh, so far is that patients that relapse after CAR T cells, it's because um, the tumor's mutated, and so the CAR can't identify it anymore. And so I think it's fascinating to look at options um, that may target more than one antigen in order to help prevent that relapse. Great. Th thank you so much. It's always, it's always nice to hear where we're going to go in the future. So some of the, some of the granular regulatory questions that, that folks have, and one I, I, I need to go back and, and, and help people understand about pre-IND's, but the question here is, could two pre-IND meetings be granted by the Office of Tissue and Cellular Therapies for the same cell-based gene therapy product, one for CMC and another one for non-clinical and clinical aspects? Um, I think that's an important question to talk about early. So, no, we, we generally um, have one pre-IND meeting for each product. Um, you know, if you have questions about your product, it may be that it's uh, a really novel product and that a approaching the FDA early for an interact meeting um, would give you some of that CMC help ahead of time. Although this, the interacts are usually more for um, for pre or for preclinical studies to understand the types of things that are needed, but they you can get CMC information there as well. Um, so that is one avenue uh, if you have a lot of questions. Great, thanks. Um, here's a question, and I'm not even sure I understand it, but is the vector used ex vivo actually classified as drug substance or just requires equivalent documentation? And will the manufacturer be subject to an obligatory pre-approval inspection? I guess that's for the, for the, the viral, whether it be an AAV or a, or a lenivirus. Yeah, so this is really, um, a good question for the FDA. We've been very strong on our opinion that the vector itself is critical to the CAR T cell function. It is a drug substance. It is subject to pre-approval inspections, so we inspect um, both the CAR T cell manufacturing facilities and then any facilities that are associated with the vector itself. Thank you. And 
what kind of questions, so the, the CMC questions at a pre-IND meeting, what, what should a company come in with and what should they be asking to make sure that they've covered all their bases? So a lot of times for pre-IND meetings, we get this huge package and then it says, is our CMC okay? And, um, you know, we're looking at it and, and trying to give advice, but you as the developer knows your product and knows where you have the most questions and perhaps where it differs the most from other products in the field. And so trying to ask specific questions about your product, um, about the materials that are being used, about your assay development. A lot of the assays for gene therapies are product specific and have to be developed in-house. The other thing um, that I think is useful to discuss during a pre-IND meeting is understanding how to um, structure your release testing. Um, and so, you know, what assays can be report results? Um, so for early stage studies, we are open to report results for many of your characterization studies, um, but the safety tests, those need to be, um, uh, you know, have actual results. You know, you, you have to make sure you have a sterile product and it's not mycoplasma contaminated before you put it into a patient. Um, and so kind of understanding about how the release testing, um, wh what's required for that for phase one is a good topic to cover in a pre-IND meeting. Great. We get one more question here before we run out of time. And this goes along the, the, along the lines of, I've sat in a lot of meetings with people developing CAR T cells. You know, we can change a vector in a week, right? We can, we can make the linker longer or, or, or change, you could even, you could change the, the co-stimulatory aspect of the, of the chimeric antigen research T cell. But if we do that, it takes so much work and so much energy and effort to put that vector in the T cells. Hey, is there, you know, let's say, yeah, I think, well, why can't I just, I can do that vector change in my lab. I can run it through a chiagen column and, ha and have the plasmid. But it, it's so much more complicated. Are there, is it just, is this just the way it has to be done? Yeah, so a change in the product, you know, a change in the transgene is a change in the product. And there's a wealth of data out there um, from the field showing that changes in your linker can have fundamental differences uh, in the activity of your product. Um, and so understanding um, how it's going to affect your product, how it may relate to the preclinical data that you've generated, um, whether or not the clinical data that you already have with your, you know, first uh, transgene, if that can be applied to, you know, your clinical studies with this new transgene. Um, I, as we're early in the field, um, it's difficult to, to gauge that. And so um, it's, it's on the sponsor to show comparability. Um, and we've been working with sponsors a lot in order to understand um, the types of information that would need to go into a comparability study. Um, but definitely a change in a transgene um, by the FDA is considered a change in the product because it could affect um, the product function. Great, thanks. Well, that clock reached zero a couple minutes ago. We're gonna, I, I, once again, we're gonna have to move down the evolutionary ladder from cellular therapies to a lower life form. But Dr. Schultz, thank you so much for being here today and discussing what I think is the most impactful new anti-cancer therapy in the past decade. Uh, Lisa, would you do us the pleasure of introducing our next speaker? <laughs> 